uh, again, we're going to we're still in the first narrative of the book of Matthew, the first narrative. Remember, we said the book of Matthew. Of course, it, it is it is bookmarked with the uh, prelude and the passion narrative, but in the middle, from chapters roughly chapter three through chapter twenty six, there are five sections of the book of Matthew. And each of those sections have a narrative portion and a what is called a teaching or discourse portion. So when we look at the book of Matthew, he is going about it, writing his book in a certain style and in a certain way so that the, the, the preaching portions will be describing what we're reading in the narrative and how Jesus' ministry unfolds as his journey to the cross Begin. So in Matthew chapter 4, I'd like to read verses 1 through 11. If you would follow along with me. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, and at least you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And the devil again took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and only serve him. Only shall you serve him. And the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Let us pray. Father, the battle of temptation in our lives should humble us. Help us, Lord, in our weakness this morning. Help us to never think that we have conquered a temptation in our life. Help us to rely upon your goodness and the sure foundation of your word is truth. I pray, Father, that you would humble us this morning and by being humble, we would be actually strong. Help us to fight the temptations that so easily entangle us. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start off this morning by reading four quotes about temptation. First comes from Henry Ward Beecher, says, Temptation... Without implies desires within. Men ought not to say how powerfully the devil tempts me, but how strongly I am tempted. Thomas Boston says, Temptation is the fire that brings the scum up from the heart. John Bunyan says, Temptations, when we meet them at first, are as the lion that roared upon Samson. But if we overcome them, the next time we will see them, next time we see them, we will, shall find a nest of honey within them. Edwin Chaplin said, This is the most fearful act to think of, that in every human heart there is a secret spring that would be weak at the touch of temptation, and that is liable to be assailed. Fearful and yet sultry to think of, for the thought for the thought may serve to keep our moral nature braced. It warns us that we can never stand at ease or lie down in the field of life without the sentinels of watchfulness and campfires of prayer. Temptation. It's something we will be without in heaven. Praise the Lord. One of the things about growing in the Christian life is that you become more keenly, I think, aware of temptation. It is not that 
Christians, you know, we, we hear a lot about victory over temptation, and that, and that is true. But temptation is something that, as you grow in the Christian life, you recognize the more temptations, the more difficulties that you have, and the, and the waywardness of your heart. I see, our hearts are prone to wonder. We like to think that we're okay. But as you grow in the Christian life, you become more sensitive to the temptations that you face day in and day out. It's the little things that do matter. And so this morning, when you, when you look at temptations in your whole, whole heart, I want you to look at your heart this morning. I've been looking at my heart and realizing that I have to fight. And I have to fight much harder. I have to fight with all of God's strength. I have to rely more upon God's Word. I have to hide God's Word more and more in my heart. Now, now people who read this section of Matthew, um, come in, they, 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 they make two mistakes, I think. They give way to temptation in their own life. They, they blame God for temptation. Now that's, that's common. If, if God was really loving, He would, you can fill in the blank, right? Or, they become independent. They declare their independence from God and say, you know what? I can do it myself. That stems from a wrong view of who you are because when you think you can do it yourself, you're really saying to God, I, I'm basically without need. I'm basically without the need of the cross. I think the more we study temptation, the more we really find out that the more we need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The more we need to hear about His death, burial, and resurrection. You see, Jesus, when in last chapter when He was baptized, had been declared by God, it says in verse 17, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And God was declaring that this son would be the son who would sacrifice his life on the cross. But the passage that is quoted in Isaiah and in Psalm 2, we realize that Jesus is going to be not only the suffering servant, but also the reigning king. And so immediately after, it says in, in, in Mark, if you, if you look at different passages, Mark just has a short version. It doesn't really give the temptations, but Luke has the temptations, but in the second and third are in reverse order. Matthew has more of a chronological theme. Uh, Mark, or Luke has more of a thematic uh, organization to them. But they're all the same temptations. So temptation comes in a lot of forms, and, and we, we are tempted always to cut corners, aren't we? There's a story that I read this week that many years ago, uh, Boeing and I believe it was um, Douglas were bidding on a contract for Eastern Airlines. They were going to make one of the big jets. And, and the owner, and the chairman of the board came to, to I believe it was Douglas, and, and told, the, told the president of Douglas, said, hey, your, your bid is great, only one thing. Uh, your noise cancellation is unacceptable. And Douglas the president thought about it for a moment and says, um, really, there's nothing I don't think we can do to lower the noise uh, cancellation of this plane. The president or chairman of the board of Eastern said, well, that's good because I was just making sure you were still honest about it. You see, we are tempted to cut corners, to shade the truth, to to make it look like we are in a better position than we really are when God knows our hearts. You can't hide from God, can you? We try to. We try to hide from God. We try to hide from ourselves. We try to hide from things. But if you really allow the Scriptures to open up your heart and to pierce your heart and to define what sin is and look at the temptations of your life, you realize that you, when you walk out the door every single day, you are in a battle. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at war. We are at war in a battle not only for, for, for the victory over temptation, but for the glory of God being displayed in our midst. 
There's a war going on. There is a battle. And it resides in our own hearts. Because the Bible says, for out of the heart springs the seasons of life. You see, today I want you to understand that you are in a battle. And that little things do matter. Attention to the details of your life and to the devotion that you have to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the reading of the Word and to prayer as means of His grace are highly important to our lives. And there's something we never grow out of or, or, or never get over with. We, we need to constantly preach the gospel and hear the gospel to ourselves because guess what? Every week we come into this service, all of us have rebelled against the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us, including myself. And the only way I stand up here, and the only way Pastor Larry stands up here, is because we know that the gospel has satisfied the anger and wrath of God against us, and the grace of God has changed our life so much that we want to tell the world about the great news of Jesus. But if you're going to fight, you have to, you have to look at temptation. You have to know when it comes. I, I just want this morning, as we look at the text this morning, to find a couple ways that temptation hits us and comes at us. Look at verses 1 and 2. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Right here we find, first of all, the temptation comes to us after some of our greatest victories. Immediately before this event happened, Jesus was baptized by John, and God has spoken from the heavens that this is my son, who I am well pleased. It was declaring that Jesus had committed himself to the cross. He had committed himself to the will and the plan of God, that he was the son of God. He was going to be the true son, the true king. And so here Jesus was, he was working on this, and he was, he, you know, victory comes. The reason why temptation comes, think about this. Temptation comes after a victory because, guess what? We become self-confident. I was raised on the idea of rugged individualism, which is the American philosophy of self-confidence. That you have to be confident. That you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You have to do everything you can to not be a wimp, so to speak. But you know what? Self-confidence can get us into a lot of trouble. I remember, and Pastor Lay, you probably remember this too, since it's a football example of the Dallas Cowboys. I think it was the Super Bowl. And I think that the Dallas Cowboys were beating the Buffalo Bills quite handily. And I, th I don't know if it was a fumble or an interception, but a man, I think he was an offensive, defensive lineman by the name of Leon Lett, picked up a football, and he was running. This guy's about 280, 300 pounds, maybe. He's running down the field. And he, he's just soaking in the crowd. He's running, and he's running. And all of a sudden, at the four-yard line, a little bitty guy, maybe five foot eight, by the name of Don Beebe, comes up, knocks the ball out of his hands, gets the ball, and now it's the Buffalo Bills ball, and he goes back to the bench going, man, I was way overconfident. I, I'm sure he's thinking, man, if I just hold on to the ball four more yards. See, a lot of times when we think we have it in the bag, Satan comes and will tempt us because our own hearts are way too self-confident. You can see that in the Bible. Some of the greatest men in the Bible who performed some of the greatest deeds became self-serving. Remember Elijah? There was a man on Mount Carmel had challenged and won over one against 450 prophets of Baal, or Baal. 
And immediately we find him after that event, some great, you know, that, that's a great event, that's a great victory. All of a sudden, we find him asking God to take his life because he's in such depression. You see, I want you to notice that we can become very self-confident and God uses, God uses the temptations to humble us. Now, God does not tempt us. But I want you to look at what the passage says. Then Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. It was God's sovereign good, providential plan for Jesus to be tempted by the devil. I believe that's the same with you and me. But let me, let me just say something about temptation. Temptation trials and tests. While they come from the same word, the same word is used for all three of them are not the same thing. You can look back, if you look at James chapter 1, a very familiar passage to probably many of you, especially to me because I, I love the first part of James because it, it just encourages me to keep on fighting against temptation. But it says, count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. There is the word trials, which has the same root in the original language, and it says in the next verse, For we know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And then in verse 13 it says, Let no one say when I am tempted, I am tempted by God. All three things are occurring at the same time. And back over in Matthew, when the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness, He is leading them to the wilderness to fulfill the righteousness that was established by God. Remember Adam and Eve? They had a perfect environment. And what happened when Satan came? They fell. Jesus here is hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Much like Israel in the wilderness. Well, the wilderness is a place where we all go sometimes. And Jesus went to the wilderness because of the plan of God. And sometimes God will take us to the wilderness because He has to slay our pride. He has to slay. When we become victorious in many ways, He has to humble us because we become way too self-confident and vulnerable. See, when you think you're the least vulnerable, you're the most. And when you think you're the most vulnerable, you're probably more watchfulness. It's the idea that when we were hit with 9-11, immediately we became very watchful about terrorism. But as time goes on, and I will guarantee you, one generation, another generation, we become less and less vigilant about the attacks that can come upon our lives. Time does that. We become lazy. You and I are lazy spiritually. And, and as time goes on, we think we're okay. We're doing well. But Adam failed the first test, and now Jesus, being tempted by the devil, is going to be the victor over the devil, the accuser of the brethren. See, he was the archangel who, who, who led the rebellion against God. And, and let me just say this, when we're thinking about victory over sin, I, I think we should, should think about it in this way. We need to have humility over sin. We need to realize that it is God's strength and God's power because, listen to this, every step that we take in this world is a step into the presence of temptation. We will be tempted from every step that we take. Every thought that we think needs to be guarded and, and, and bolstered with the Word of God and with prayer. Those two means of God's grace and one of the means of God's grace, I, I really believe, and is that when we celebrate even the memorial of the Lord's Supper, is that we remember that the gospel of our Lord is sufficient and good to save us from our sins. And when you come here on Sunday morning, you need to hear that Jesus saves people from sins, don't you? You know your own heart. I know my heart. You know your heart and you know the struggles of temptation that come and go and come and go and, and how you rationalize some and how you defeat others. And you tell yourself you're okay. 
But Jesus was tempted by the devil. And so temptation comes after victory. Even in Matthew 6, when, when, when Jesus said, you know, Lord, uh, do not lead us into, what does it say? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus is not saying that, that God, I don't want to be tempted because temptation is a way... Now, God does not tempt. He tests. He proves. He, he lets you see what's really in your own heart because that's what God was doing with the nation of Israel. For 40, day, for 40 years, they wandered around the wilderness and we're going to find out that in that 40 years, God was testing them to prove them so that they would be overcomers. When they got into the promised land, they would depend on God and not depend upon their own strength or their own might or their own abilities. You remember, just remember David, little David when he slew Goliath. He trusted in God. And God's abilities. What God could do. Not what he could do. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, I think a, a passage that we turn to often. It says, No temptation is overtaking that is not common to man. I'm going to stop there and just say, I don't care what temptations you're struggling with this morning. But it doesn't matter. It could be the worst thing in the world that you think in your mind. You may be plotting to, I hope not, to murder somebody or, 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 or to betray somebody. But I want you to know that whatever you struggle with, whatever habitual sin you struggle with in your, in your life, and even the temptations, you're not alone. It's not new. But God, it says, is faithful. And He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, He will provide a way of escape. In other words, let me just say this. In your temptation, God will not leave Himself without a witness to His superiority over sinful allurements. He will always, in the middle of your battle, give you a witness to His superiority over whatever it is you're battling. Many times that comes from His Word, but many times it comes from other people. That's why we need others. And so remember, it, it is so important that if we're going to fight our temptations to come at us, and remember the temptations, the only reason why we are tempted is not because of the power of the devil. It's because of the deceitfulness of our hearts. Satan would have nothing upon us if our hearts are right. If our hearts are good. But the problem with mankind is that our hearts are not right. Their hearts, hearts love to wander away from God, even, even for believers. And we need to hear that God in His cross actually accomplished the salvation of His sinners. That He, he will make God, uh, He will make the beauty of God uh, he will preserve sinners who have been saved by giving them an, an, a greater allurement for the beauty of God throughout their lives. And so very, very, very clearly, I think the Bible tells us that he goes into three different temptations. I think they teach us something else about how to fight temptation. So we said that, you know, we, we have to realize that, that, you know, temptation comes after every victory, but temptation also comes... When we try to meet legitimate needs illegitimately, and you're asking, what do I mean by that? It means we try, we have legitimate needs in our life. There are physical needs. There are hunger needs. There are, there are you, you name a need that you have, then, then, then we try to meet that need in a, in a way that is contrary to the way God has planned. That's illegitimate needs. But look what it says in, in, back in Matthew chapter uh, 4. It says, <clears throat> no, 3 and 4. It says, Then the tempter came and said to him, 
If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Okay, now I want you to notice, each time the devil tempted Jesus, who did he call him? He said, if you are what? Who? The Son of God. Now, we, we know that that title was given to him, what? Just a chapter earlier by who? God, right? He was declaring, this is my Son. This is the Savior. This is the King. This is the suffering servant. And here is the Son of God who is going to take away the sins of the world. And now Satan comes up and says, if you are the Son of God. Now, I know Satan knows that Jesus is the Son of God. The word if is not questioning Jesus is the Son of God. It is more like saying, since you are the Son of God, well, let me test you on this. And so he says, if you are the Son of God, here, here make these stones to become what? Bread. Right? Loaves of bread. We already know that from, from chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, it says, uh, And do not presume to yourself, we are Abraham's father. I'll tell you, God is able from the stones to raise up children of Abraham. And if God can raise up from stones children, he can definitely raise up from stones bread, loaves of bread, right? We, 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 would, we would definitely think that. That would be very, very common to say that. Uh, we, we would have no problem with that. Now, now, if you look at this, Jesus, you know, was saying the, the stones recall uh, an incident. Back, back in Exodus chapter 17, in Exodus chapter 17, we, we know that, that this reminded the people of Israel that, there's, that, that, that God can create loaves of bread or He can create water from rock, right? Do you remember the story of Moses when, when the children of Israel were, were, were kind of rebelling from God and asking, well, where is God and what is He doing and we don't have anything and then God said He would provide water from the rock? Look at what it says. He says, in verse 1, he says, in, verse, in chapter 17 of Exodus, he says, and all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of the sin, excuse me, Wilderness of, of sin by stages, according to the commandments of the Lord, and called it, called, he camped at Rephraim, Rephraim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and says, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? So here again, people are saying, Well, God's not playing fair. Now, and now they, you, you see later on it says, in verse 5 it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which you, struck, which you struck the Nile, and go. And behold, I will stand before you, and there will be a rock at Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so at the sight of God. Now this isn't, this isn't loaves of bread. But we realize that God can provide in any way He wants to. God is a supernatural God and He can provide in whatever way He wants to. And so we have to understand that the temptation here is for Jesus to fulfill a need that He had illegitimately, a way that is not part of God's plan. Does that make sense? See, if you're going to fight temptation, you have to recognize when you are trying to meet a need in your life in a way that God has not prescribed. You have to recognize that. You, you, you have to understand that. You see, Moses eventually failed because remember later on in Numbers when the story is told again of the water, he, he did it in an incorrect way. He hit it twice. And God said that because of that, he would, he would not enter the promised land. See, God is very specific in the way that He orchestrates and he, he meets those types of needs. Now, I want you to notice, what did Jesus say to Satan? What did He say? He said, it is written, man shall not live by what? Bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. When we try to meet our own needs and not rely on God, we are candidates for temptation. 
when we try to orchestrate events in our life to, to please us, we are candidates for great temptation to come into our lives because our hearts are not depending again on God. Just like it, after a victory, what, what comes is self-sufficiency. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Look at, look at what happened. They're, they're going to the promised land and he's telling them to remember the Lord. Remember the Lord your God, what he has done for you. And it's in verse 3 that he quotes. But look at verses 1 and 2. It says, The whole commandment that I command you today, that you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. Now listen to this. The reason why he was in the wilderness is the same, same reason, is to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, God's not concerned about that, but he's testing them so that they would understand. And he says, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with what? Manna? Remember manna? The, manna really means what is it? Which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. We're all... To be human is to have great needs. There are people in this world that have much greater needs than everybody who is here this morning. There are people that... Some people don't have any drinking water. Some people... Uh, you know, we take for granted things that we have that are met. And we should praise God for them. Shouldn't we? And God has been so good to us. Been so good to me. And when I complain, I, I often remind myself that... Oh, listen, my, my heart's way... My, my, my heart is the problem. Not, not the, the needs. Not God. God is doing everything and, and has blessed me and, and has encouraged me and done all so much stuff for me. And, and in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he, he talks about how he has done that. He says, listen, listen in verse 11. He says, take care, in, in Deuteronomy 8, uh, at least you forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments and rules and His statutes which I command you today. At least when you have eaten and are full and have, been, and have built good houses and lived in them and when your herds and flock multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. See, we forget the Lord our God. When our needs are met, guess what? We go off our merry way, don't we? Even as believers... We, we, we sometimes forget that it is God that has provided all those things. We are stewards of everything that we have. We own absolutely nothing in this life. And we are going to take absolutely nothing to heaven. We are stewards. God gives us things. But the problem is the gifts of God can become the exact things that cause us to move away from God. God gives good gifts to be enjoyed. Nothing wrong with homes or farms or animals or livestock or investments or anything like that unless it becomes the idol of our hearts and our hearts become forgetful of God. That's what Jesus was saying. He says, listen, you know, I'm not going to forget God. God is going to be the one who provides all that I need. In verse 16 of, 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 of uh, chapter 8 of Deuteronomy, it says, he reminds them, it says, Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you to test you to do good in the end? See, if you're here this morning, you're struggling with God, you're struggling with temptation, you're struggling with trials. Let me tell you, God is, is working in your life. I know that because he wants you to do good. He wants to create good. He, he's conforming you to the person and image of His Son. And so we've seen so far that there are really, the, the temptation comes at us because we, 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 we think we are victory, we think after a victory we're self-sufficient, and temptation comes to us because we try to meet needs illegitimately. 
But if you look at the next temptation, it says in verse 5, 6, 5 and 6, it says, And the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bury you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Now, let me, let me, let me just make an observation. When Jesus responded to Satan, what did he do? He quoted Scripture. Now, there are four statements of Scripture in this passage. Jesus quotes three. And in this temptation, what did the Satan actually quotes Scripture? He quotes a Scripture, Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. Look at Psalm 91, verses 12. Some people say Psalm 91 is, is a victorious psalm. It's about God's going to defeat all your enemies. God's going to do everything for you. You will not have any problems in this life. Now, that's not true, but... It seems that way. Look, look what it says in verse, verse 1. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My, refu my, Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you up or cover you with pinion, his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by the day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at the noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will, not, you will, you will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague shall become near you, near your tent. In other words, this is a really good promise, isn't it? I mean, so far so good, right? Look at verse 11 and 12, which, which is quoted in Matthew. Matthew quotes, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, now, what Satan? What did Satan do? This is what Satan did. He used that passage to try to get Jesus to say, "God, the Father is going to act. Or you're going to make God act in a certain way." So here's what you do, Jesus. He says, he'll give your angels charge over you, and on their hands they will bear you, at least you strike your foot against the stone. In other words, Jesus, if you throw yourself down from this pinnacle, from, this, from, from this, the temple, Solomon porch, and they were up high, they were looking out, if you throw yourself down from here, God is going to rescue you. And you know what that is? See, temptation comes when we try to make God act in a certain way. And that's what Satan was doing. He was trying to get Jesus to force God to act in a certain way that God had not promised to act. See, God will... will, will it did say God would take charge of us. God would... would it said that God would uh, take command concerning you with His angels if you stumble or if you fall. But it did not say if you did it deliberately. See, what Satan is doing is saying, here, test God. Put God on trial and see if God is faithful. And what did Jesus do? Jesus answers in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And this is from Deuteronomy 6.16. It, it, it basically almost says this, the exact same thing. It says, you shall not put the Lord your God to test as He tested you at Massa. Remember, we, we even read the passage where, where God it was testing the people and, and the people were complaining that they didn't have drink to eat. And when, 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 they, when they got the water... Moses called it Massa or Meribah, the bitterness of that water, because the people did not trust God. And another reason temptation come to us, as we see here, that Satan actually put forth is that when we want to make God act in a certain way, and we complain when He doesn't act in a certain way. So if you are the Son of God, force God's hand. 
Make him do something and see if he's real. And what did Jesus say? You're not going to test the Lord your God. You're not going to put him on trial. You can't put him on trial. And so Jesus is answering God with the Word of God. And let, let me just say this about the Word of God. Just as application. I heard this quote this week. It has been really on my heart to memorize Scripture because I, I, I say it with my mouth, but I think one of the most greatest and, and blessed ways to defeat temptation is by the hiding of the Word of God in our hearts. I, I, I need to remember where I, where I heard it, but, but it said this. It said, someone said, if you don't memorize Scripture, all of your prayers will be worldly prayers. And I, I tend to believe that. Because the more we hide the Word of God in our heart, the more we will answer the temptation with the truth of God's Word. We won't, we won't be so self-prideful to say, hey, I won the victory. Or we, we won't be the, the person who says, let me meet my need. Or we won't be the person who, who says, well, let me, God, you need to act for me in this way. The more we memorize, the more we hide the Word of God, the more we meditate on it, the more our prayers will be filled with the words that God has spoken. You see, temptations are difficult. We have to be on guard to fight our temptation. There is a man by the name of Wilbur Chaplin who, who gives a uh, particular parable of temptation. He says this in his parable. Each man must discover for himself what particular things are temptations to him. Among the evil growths in my garden, there is one which I dare not lay a hand upon. The slightest touch of it will cause my skin to break out. And if the antidote is not properly applied, I would wind up in such perilous pain that I would never know which end is up or down. I watch and wonder as the laborer for whom I sent appears and handles it with utmost impunity, a power which few possess. This, this, this growth in my garden. Of course, there's nothing about, about its appearance that denotes it's a poison. That it is such a simple matter of knowledge. Knowing that it is a poison. He, he goes on in the parable and says, this plant, this virus, this poison is none other than poison ivy. And, and the only thing that would cause you to understand that it was a poisonous plant was the knowledge of what the plant was like. See, you see, he says that there is, there is something that looks almost like poison ivy that's called the Virginia creeper. It has five leaves, but the poison ivy has only three. And he says, if he had not the knowledge, he, he, would have, he would have not resisted the urge to touch it and to handle it. He says it's the same way with temptation. Many times temptation looks very bland. Ah, it's something I can get away with, not something that's going to harm me that much. But really temptations, when they're given in to, harm you greatly. They do. See, we don't know the power of temptation because what we do to relieve temptation many times is to give in to them. But we know Jesus, our high priest, is like us, experienced temptation, the Bible says, in all the ways that we have. It says in, in Hebrews chapter 4, 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. See, you know the power of temptation when you resist it. Many pastors have used the story of uh, three men going down into a pit on a rope. And the rope is a hundred pound test. 
But as they go down and they go down, they, they put weights on them and they, they're added weights upon them. And as the weight gets harder and harder, the rope ties tighter and tighter around their waist. And man number one, when he gets to 30 pounds, jettisons it and says, you know what, I'm going to give in. I'm, I'm going I'm to untie the rope and go down in the pit the, the, the hard way. <laughs> Same thing with man number two. I mean, he might resist a little bit more, but as the, the rope ties around his belly and his belly starts to hurt and it starts to itch, it starts to get painful, he says, this is not worth it. I'm going to just give in. I'm going to untie the rope. The final man who, 100 pound test, goes down and says, you know, I can't give in. I can't give in. I lo really love my Lord. I really love my God. I really love my family. I really love my church. I really love the things that God has said in His Word. And he gets to be 70 pounds and 80 pounds and 90 pounds and, and his stomach is, is now such and such pain that he says, you know, it would be a lot easier to give in. But he doesn't. And he finds out that he gains more joy in fighting temptation than he ever has in giving in. See, every time you give in to temptation, you lose the joy of your salvation. You lose the experience of God. You lose all those things. See, if temptation comes to us after every victory. Temptation comes to us when we try to meet legitimate needs illegitimately. And temptation comes to us when we try to force God to act in a certain way. And the final, the final thing that Jesus did here was it says in verse 8, 9, and 10, He says, And again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus says, Be gone, for it is written. It is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Deuteronomy. Back over to Deuteronomy 6. 13. Says the same thing. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. And you shall serve Him. By His name you shall swear. It's God we fear. It's God that we worship. It's God that we serve. So you see, Matthew is defining worship as not just listening to a sermon or singing a song, but, but fearing God, realizing that He is the source of your strength and the ability of your life. See, serving the Lord is worshiping. God demands right worship, doesn't He? In, in fact, everything we do depends on rightly worshiping God. If we don't love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, the Bible tells us, even in Deuteronomy, and, and, and as, as, Matthew's, as Matthew's quoting Deuteronomy, you know, in Deuteronomy 6, you, you look up in Deuteronomy 6, you find that a lot of times that um, God is telling that. He says in Deuteronomy 6, he says in verse 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And these words in verse 6, chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, you shall teach them diligently to your, to your children and talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you're down and when you rise. And in verse 10 he says, And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob, and with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses of full of good things. And then verse 12, Then at least take care, he says. Take care that you don't forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For it is the Lord your God you shall fear. And what Satan was trying to do, what Satan was really trying to get at, he was trying to get Jesus to fulfill His mission apart from the cross, apart from the plan of God. 
And there's no way that we can come to God in any other way but the cross of Jesus Christ in order to worship Him. We are just as dependent upon the gospel today to worship God as we were when we were saved from our sins, when we initially accepted Christ, when we initially put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are just as dependent upon the work of the cross now when we come to worship. Because we are bombarded every single day with temptation. James chapter 2 verse 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, like for food, the desires of the eyes, for stuff, the pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. In other words, lives forever. Jesus was tempted in every single way, but without sin. Jesus was the perfect Adam, the true Moses, the right Israel. Where other people have failed in the temptation when it came to Satan, there was no sin found in Jesus, and He became the Lord and Savior of our lives. We have to fight. We have to fight temptation. We fight temptations in many different ways. We, we avoid situations where we're tempted. We, we say no in the first five seconds, maybe when temptation arrives. If you wait more than five seconds, guess what you'll be doing? You'll be entertaining it. See, see we want, someone, someone has said this, someone says, what makes Resisting temptation difficult for many people is they don't want to discourage it completely. They like some of the temptation. They have to be able to say no within the first five seconds. Let us, as a people, say no. Let us turn immediately to Christ. Let us enjoy the presence of God and remember the joy of our salvation. And that everything God has for us is much better than His gifts if we turn them into idols. You've got to fight. You're at war. Your weapons are prayer and the Word of God. And as much as you, if, the more you spend time investing in prayer and the Word of God, the more you'll be able to fight temptation. But the more you trust in your own self and your own ways and your own ideas, you'll find yourself maybe even unknowingly giving in to temptation. See, it's not the big things that get us into trouble. It's the little things over time, isn't it? It's the little things. It's the small things that, that, that happen over time, little bit by little bit by little bit by little bit. They creep into our lives and we don't even know that they're there. Until one day we see a forest of sin. But the good news today that Jesus Christ that I present to you can forgive that sin. He comes to you to say, listen, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Fight temptation. But fight it with the means that God has given you. Let us pray.